welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We have allowed ourselves to become so disconnected and ignorant about something that is as intimate as the food that we eat. Be prepared to grow your own for victory. I said I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yeam lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink foam pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadowlark. So God made a farmer. Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm your host, Harold Thornbro, and you know what? I usually say I'm glad you're joining me today, but I'm just glad to be back with you today. It's been a little while since I've done a podcast, a, a few weeks, and special thanks to, to Troy and Kelly for stepping in there in the last couple episodes and guest hosting for me. You guys did a great job. I really appreciate it, and uh, you guys will just never know how much that meant to me that you guys were willing to step in and, and do that for me. And if you haven't heard, especially last week's episode, I know the first week we had a little bit, they had a little bit of audio trouble and uh but the second week was just an excellent podcast if you haven't heard it uh go to smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 56 and check out that episode really really good a uh, good podcast episode on uh, raising pastured pork hey on today's show i thought uh i would like to talk to you a little bit about uh homesteading legacy uh the legacy that's been handed down to you and the uh the legacy that you will hand down to your children and grandchildren and you know recent events have had me thinking a little bit about that and i'll talk about that here in a minute but i'm also going to uh close today with the main topic being getting started homesteading without land uh several people uh that i've chatted with in the past are apartment dwellers or folks with just hardly any land or maybe rented property where they can't do a whole lot so i've got 11 tips today on on getting started homesteading without land any land at all even so we'll talk a little bit about that too um but first of all i just want to give you an update on what's been going on with me uh we had just a lot of things (laughs) happen in the last month first was my mother uh She had uh, ended up in the emergency room and come to find out she had a tumor in her colon about uh, probably larger than a grapefruit. I mean, a very large tumor. And, um, of course, we were off a little while while she was dealing with that. She ended up having to have a surgery. They removed the tumor. And, uh, you know, we had a little bit of a good news there. I mean, the doctor came in and he said, you know, got it all, but, you know, she didn't have to go through chemo and stuff. And. And then later, and this is something I haven't really even shared with the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group, but later they, uh, about a week or so later, the doctor came in and said, to his surprise, it was not cancer. He'd never seen a tumor get that big and look that aggressive without being cancer. But they ran all the tests on it, and she's not going to have to do chemo now. So that was a real blessing. But on the other side of it, she's had a little bit of complications with her surgery, and she ended up back in intensive care, as you heard Troy mention last week uh, on his episode, because I'd shared that with him, and he passed it on to you. But she ended up back in intensive care, uh, had some some issues, some bleeding issues and and such. But uh, that's all taken care of now. She seems to be doing much better. They've actually sent her to a a nursing home short term to get a little bit of help getting back on her feet and stuff. And, uh, you know, she just has a little bit of hard time standing up and walking and with the surgery and all at her age. And so they're working with her on that, trying to get her back into shape. So, uh, of course took a load off me, but, uh, then a couple weeks ago, I've been about two and a half weeks now, uh, our grandson, uh, was born and I've talked about that. I've talked about him being on his way here a while back on the podcast, but he he showed up about two and a half weeks ago, which was about two and a half weeks early uh, from when he was supposed to be born. But uh, my daughter had had some complications. She'd been sick. She had uh, some issues. So they went ahead and decided to do a C-section, take him early. Two and a half weeks early, he was still nine pounds, 15 ounces. So he was a big boy, but it wasn't ideal. Um, we had known that uh, they had told us when they took her in for the C-section that mom and dad and the baby would all be together. And the next time we saw them, they would be in the room together. So we waited in her room and just uh, waited for them to get back in there. So we knew she'd have to you know, be in recovery for just a little bit, and then they would all come back in together. Well, we actually seen them rushing the baby down the hallway, and my wife asked the nurse, I said, is that ours? She goes, yep, this is yours. So we thought, well, that isn't right. So my wife asked another nurse and said, well, what's going on? I mean, is there a, is there a problem? Is that normal? She said, well, that isn't typically normal, so I'll go find out what's going on. 
And she come back and said, well, he's just a little low on oxygen, we think. So we're just giving him a little bit of oxygen. He looked a little shell-shocked. So uh, he, he seems all right, though. And we went down there, heard him crying. He sounded good. And, um, you know, about a half an hour or so later, they brought my, my daughter back into the room. And then the doctor came in and wanted to talk to her and uh, asked us to leave the room. So we knew something was going on. And uh, when we well, we actually found out that it, they thought he was having oxygen problems because he turned blue. Well, what it was when they go to check the joints and, you know, arms and legs, make sure everything's connected good and everything's working right. They was kind of grabbing him kind of hard and squeezing him and he bruised all over. I mean, he just turned blue from bruises and it turned out his platelet level was just super low. And, uh, they flew him on a helicopter uh, a couple hours away to Indianapolis. Well, I guess it's about an hour and a half away. And, um, to, to get a platelet transfusion and find out what was going on. So needless to say, that wasn't ideal. Uh, so, uh, of course my daughter had to stay in our hometown. Uh, she just had a, a C-section. So dad was going to go to Indianapolis to be with the baby. And my wife stayed with my daughter. So I went up with him to Indy and, and we, you know, was there when they were checking him out and finding out what was going on. And, and he ended up being up there for nine days. It took three days for my daughter to be able to get up there with him, but she was finally able to get up there and spend, spend her days with him. And, you know, I just, it was a lot going on and I'll just say he's doing so much better. I mean, he, he's doing great. He's home now. Everything's, he, he's just awesome. I was just holding him an hour ago and, uh, he just, he's just great. And, and I just want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, there was some, uh, in the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group, which you're, if you're not a member of, you really ought to be a member of that group. It's just a wonderful community of people, and all you have to do to join is ask. So just search in Facebook for Homestead Front Porch and um, join that group. Uh, just ask, and we'll get you right in there. And um, just a great group of people I'd mentioned in there. And uh, there was some who sent uh, gifts to help my daughter out and, and others who who – we're praying and a lot of kind words and inspiration and just so thankful for that. And, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, often how, you know, I started this podcast, uh, I think this is episode 57. I started this podcast, um, to help others, to help others get into homesteading, to inspire folks. And I got to tell you that it's, I think it's made a bigger difference in my life than anybody's the community that's been built around this the 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 contacts i've made the friends i've made uh, has been amazing and uh, i just want to thank all of you um, for your help and your kind words and you know the great gift you give to me of just being listeners and part of this community it it really has been way more of a blessing for me i think than it has been for anybody else uh, this podcast and this community so thank you for that thank you for all you guys have done and your prayers continue the prayers for my mom she's getting better i think she's going to be fine now it was such a blessing to hear that it wasn't cancer um such a blessing to know that my grandson's doing great now and uh i just i look forward to maybe introducing you someday to him on the podcast hopefully get him on the podcast when he gets a little bit older and starts uh doing his baby talk you know <laughs> i look forward to that but uh yeah just thank everybody uh so much for for what you've done so uh keep us in your thoughts if you would though but it is nice to get back to uh podcasting and hopefully doing a little more blogging and get back to kind of a regular schedule things are still a little bit busy of course having you know my my daughter uh has been staying here for a few days so my uh my wife could and, and me could help her with the baby a little bit until she kind of got used to things but she's doing great she's gonna be a great mom and uh she'll be uh going home here in a couple days and uh, i'm you know i think she's just gonna be just fine so but all this uh has me thinking about something and that is legacy i'm thinking a lot about you know we're coming to a time in my life where i've already lost a lot of my grandparents i still have two grandmothers alive um, one's not doing real good, you know, uh, who knows how much longer she'll be with us, you know, and then just seeing my mom go through some struggles and possibly having some pretty serious, uh, health concerns there. It just gets you thinking about what folks are going to leave behind in this world. And it really made me think about what is there that I can gain from my grandparents that have gone before me, my mom and my dad, and the things that I've gained in life, especially as it relates to homesteading, as it relates to life on a homestead and the things that you can take from them and not 
just do them yourself, but add to that legacy and pass it on to your grandchildren. Because here's the here's the truth. Um, you're the link. I'm the link. And you're the link to between your grandparents and your grandchildren. And the only way that connection is made is through you. So if you're not going to pass on that legacy and continue that leg- legacy, add to that legacy and hand it down to your grandchildren, that legacy goes away. So I, I've been, I've done kind of an exercise here recently. It really started a couple years ago when my grandfather passed away. And I remember spending quite a bit of time with him there at the end. And I remember just picking his brain a lot. We talked a lot about his garden. He had an awesome garden. He was a he was just a, a master uh, carpenter, and he built things all the time. And I just picked his brain a lot. You know, I wanted to know, give me some advice on this, growing this in your garden. You do a great job at that. Where How do you do this? And how do you build that? And where do you find those? And I just remember picking his brain a lot. And he enjoyed those conversations. And those were things that I wanted to, to pass on, you know. Uh, my grandpa left me with a uh, a knife that he made when he was a teenager um and it's nothing fancy it's just it, you know he he made it though it was it's a nice it's a decent knife like a hunting knife and he made it when he was a young man he he passed that on to my dad my dad gave it to me i look forward to giving that to my grandson one day and that knife is going to span over a hundred years by the time my grandson gets it so I, I just think about things like that, passing things down. He left me with some guns, things like that, you know, and I, those are a legacy. Absolutely. But I also consider the wisdom and the knowledge and the skills that your grandparents and your parents passed down to you, that you now have the opportunity to pass down to your children and your grandchildren. And I, of course, you know, recent events have had me thinking a lot about that and, And I was just reading the other day. If you've never read the book uh, by Ray Bradbury, Fahrenheit 451, it's it's a rather strange book. Uh, It's written a long time ago, and it was written about the future. And in the future, it's about a fireman and and – firemen, though, in the future don't put out fires. They they start fires. They burn books. That's their job. They go around and burn books, and they burn the houses down that the books are in, and sometimes they burn the people down with them that – have the books which are now illegal because it's just all about censorship there's a lot of weird stuff in that book and but there's this quote in that book that i ran across and and it seems kind of out of place in some ways but i just want to read it to you because i think it's a great quote and it's this it's everyone must leave something behind when he dies my grandfather said a child or a book or a painting or a house or a wall built or a pair of shoes made or a garden planted Something your hand touched, some way so your soul has somewhere to go when you die. And when people look at that tree or that flower you planted, you're there. It doesn't matter what you do, he said, so long as you change something from the way it was before you touched it into something that's like you after you take your hands away from it. The difference between the man who just cuts lawns and a real gardener is in the touching, he said. The lawn cutter might just as well not have been there at all. The gardener will be there a lifetime. Great quote. I read that, and I just happened to be reading that book, and I came across that, and I was like, wow, that's exactly what I've been thinking about lately. You know, leaving something behind that is a piece of you, that people look at that or listen to that or read that or see that, and they go, wow, that that's him or that's her. That That's the legacy they left behind. And and I think I started thinking a lot about that. And I thought, okay, what do my grandparents leave with me that I need to pass down to my children? And, and especially when it came to my grandpa, I, there was a lot of things there. There was a lot of words of wisdom. There was a lot of there was a lot of uh, things he built, abilities he had, uh, advice that he gave that I want to pass on to my grandson. And I guess as an exercise, how does this relate to homesteading? Well, I guess as an exercise, I would I would encourage you to not let those things of the past be forgotten. I would encourage you to to think about if your grandparents are still here, go hang out with them. If they're not still here, uh, think about or even ask your parents, what did they do? What what were some things they were good at? Um, what were some skills they had? And then, you know, whatever, what was some advice they gave you? And And put those things down on paper. And then you can add to them or just share them as the as it was passed down to you, but make sure that legacy stays alive. Uh, Pass that down to your children and your grandchildren. 
Now, I don't want to leave everybody out because I know not everybody comes from a, a rich heritage, and I know a, not everyone is going to have children or grandchildren. But that doesn't change legacy. You can still get something from the generations before, and you can leave something for the generations after of value, something good, something that's part of you. And I think homesteading is the perfect place to do that. We consider all the skills that are required in homesteading. We, we consider the wisdom and the knowledge that is passed down of, of old that we, we, we need to continue into the future. And yes, I think we can add to that legacy. We can even improve on that legacy in many ways. That's why I'm a modern homesteader. That's why I talk about modern homesteading because not everything new is bad. Uh, so many things are, are better. Um, and so we can, we can change things. We can add to things. It's important to, to know about those things of old. But let's also combine them with the things of the new. And let's pass that legacy down to the future generations. So I just wanted to leave that with you and remind you that uh, you are that link between your grandparents and your grandchildren. And don't take that for granted. It's an important thing. And I think we should all pass that down to the future generations. Okay, on to the main topic of our episode today, 11 tips for getting started homesteading without land. You know, Abraham Lincoln once said, the greatest fine art of the future will be the making of a comfortable living from a small piece of land. And I think it's a real profound statement from Mr. Lincoln. He obviously recognized the importance of carrying out the task of, of self-sufficiency and sustainability from a piece of land. And, you know, I don't think by his statement, making a comfortable living, he was only referring to financial gain, but I think rather he was uh, talking about providing for oneself and their family uh, and, give, and providing all those necessities of life. And one thing I, I doubt Mr. Lincoln could have ever imagined was a time when most of the skills needed to have a self-sufficient life would be unknown by, by the majority of the people, and that many would be in a place where they, they didn't even have a small piece of land to work with. So I guess the question I want to answer today is, what about those folks? What about the apartment dwellers? What about the people living in in a, a house with a very small backyard or maybe just a patio? What about the folks that are renting a, a piece of property and they can't really do a lot with it? Uh, they're not allowed to do a lot with it. I want to talk about that. I want to give 11 tips to those folks on getting started homesteading because I believe you can be a homesteader in those situations. At least at least lay a great foundation for homesteading while you're in those uh situations. So first thing I would say is get started with educational resources. There's great books, magazines, blogs, podcasts, uh, YouTube channels, and online courses out there. I think these are great resources for you to get started with and to start learning and growing and being inspired. So I would say take advantage of, of the educational resources that are available to you. I mean, books have always been around. I still love reading books. Books will never go away, in my opinion. I think so many people think that in a digital age, books are going away. To me, there's still nothing like holding a book in my hands. I'd rather, I, I do read ebooks and things, but I'll tell you what, I'd rather read a paper book any day. I love the feel of a book in my hands. I love putting it on my bookshelf and going and grabbing it and referencing it and writing in it and underlining stuff. And I just, I love the feel of a book, so I don't know that they'll ever go away. There's also some great magazines out there. I think of Mother Earth News um, uh, and some of the others out there that are just great resources uh, for homesteading and even inspiration. Just love to look at those magazines. So many great blogs out there. I can't even begin to mention great blogs, but you know these are generally free resources that you can learn so much from. Of course, podcasts like this one, like the one you're listening to, I think podcasts are a great resource. And you know what? This isn't the only one. There's so many other great uh, podcasts out there. And also in the show notes, if you want to go to the show notes for this episode, I'll have some links to, on some of these things where you can look at other resources. I actually wrote a blog post probably two years ago on other uh, homesteading podcasts that I like to listen to. So I'll have a link in the show notes for that. You can find those show notes at smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 57. Uh, check out the show notes and, uh, and I think you'll enjoy hearing listening to some of those other podcasts uh, youtube channels there are so many great homesteading youtube channels and you can learn so much from out there but also don't disregard paying for an online course uh, some things uh, you learn better quicker 
and are just really professionally done. Some good online courses. You might pay a little bit, but I don't think you should disregard those. Those are great educational resources. Uh, the second thing you can do uh, when you don't have any land to start homesteading is really get started in the kitchen. Food preservation is is number one, I think. Uh, blanching and freezing, canning, dehydrating, fermenting. These are super important things. You need to learn how to do those. And you can learn how to do those no matter where you're at. If you have a kitchen, you can do these things. Even if you're not growing the vegetables that you're doing these things with, um, you can go to a farmer's market and get them. Or, or go to a store and buy organic and, 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 and get these things and, and practice these things. That's food preservation uh, techniques so valuable something you'll definitely want to know if you ever even go to a bigger homestead food preparation is so important as well i think learning and practicing food preparation is is one of the most important and most often overlooked homesteading skills to develop so i would really encourage you to practice preparing the food um it's it's what good is it if you don't know how to cook it if you don't know how to to make something edible or great tasting out of it um, learn how to do those things, and you can do that without having a lot of land. You can also grow food without land. So the third thing is growing food. Um, you can container garden. You can build indoor vegetable gardening uh, setups. Uh, you can sprout microgreens and eat those. You can even join a community garden in some areas. If you're in a larger city, sometimes there are some community gardens you can be a part of where you can go and plant and pick and be part of, of, a, of a community of people gardening and, 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 and partake in that. So there's so much you can do even in gardening when you don't have any land. Um, I would say start composting is another thing you can do. Uh, you're pretty much limited in, in most ways to vermicomposting unless you want some smell, but what a great way to compost. You can't compost a lot like that, but this is this is composting with worms. But it's very simple to set up a worm bin, and it's clean. And so many people think, well, I don't want worms in my house. Well, y- you don't hardly ever have to see those worms except for when you're taking the lid off and putting some more food in there and maybe raking it around in there and covering it up. You might see a few worms. Um, you can set these in your basement. You can set them, you can set them places where they're not really going to be bothering you at all. So vermicomposting is a great way to get started composting. And I would say number five is, you know, raise small livestock without land. You don't need it. Uh, So many people raise rabbits or quail in a garage. And you can do that. And and there's some, I'm telling you, I've seen some setups on YouTube of some folks doing this um, in their garage. And it works great. And, you know, you think about quail, you got good meat, you got good eggs with rabbits. It's just a great production animal. Get a lot of meat from them. Uh, So, uh, yeah, I would suggest, you know, if you have a place like that where you could, in a garage even, you could do that. I would say one of the real important thing you can do in number six is practice frugal living. Um, You can go back to episode 46 that I did on frugal homesteading. And there's a lot of great tips in there that would benefit uh, folks. Um, in this situation without any land living frugally. There's so many things you can do to practice a frugal lifestyle, and a frugal lifestyle has great ap- application to homesteading. So I would I would advise that. Number seven, hunting and fishing. Um, you don't need a land to do that. Uh, there is some great public land out there uh, where you can go and hunt and fish. And, uh, like I do a lot of hunting and fishing on public land where I live. We have a, a place just, just a, less than five miles from me, um, a game reserve where I'm you know, able to go and hunt and fish and I hunt squirrel and rabbit and deer and, uh, go fishing there and, and just some, some great stuff there. So I actually wrote an article called how to find places to hunt. And I talk a lot about hunting public land or even how to find private land to hunt on. So uh, I'll leave a link to that article that I wrote, I don't know, I probably wrote a year and a half ago or so. Um, I'll leave a link to that article in the show notes, uh, smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 57, and you can see that link. Something else you can do on um, public land, or you don't even have to do it on public land, uh, it's real easy to find places to forage, because there's a lot of private landowners that wouldn't mind you being there foraging. And you can forage for things like edible weeds, mushrooms, berries, fruit, and nuts. Um, all of those things I, I forage for. Uh, so, you know, I think that, you know what, one of the things I love to forage for most, I mean, I know a lot of people disregard this, this tree, but that's uh mulberry. I go out and you can get so many mulberries 
uh, from trees in the wild. I mean, you can come home with, with just sacks full of mulberries. You can do so much with those, freeze them and use them later, make pies, make jellies, jams. It, just so much you can do with those. I, that's one of my favorite things to forage for. Uh, mushrooms, of course, every spring I'm out foraging for the uh, the morel mushrooms around here. And you know what? Like I think I talked about this in another episode. There's a place I know where there's a bunch of apple trees and a public woods where I'm allowed to go get those apples, and I'll go do that. And this place is not sprayed for anything or anything like that. It's a game reserve. And, uh, yeah, I can go get some great apples from there. So, yeah, nuts as well, walnuts and, and things. So depending on where you live in the country, uh, these things are available. But uh, And figure out the edible weeds. But be careful with things like mushrooms and edible weeds and berries if you don't know what they are, don't just throw them in your mouth. You know, find out for sure. Be 100% sure before you eat anything what it is and that it's not poisonous. Just to want to throw that out there. Foraging is an awesome skill to have and, and a way to provide for your homestead. But it can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. So uh, get with an expert on that or or just be real sure of what you're, or what you're putting in your mouth. So that... that just that's my advice for foraging as useful as it is it does have a a level of danger to it that you really need to be careful Uh, number nine and this is something i've really just started getting into in the last year or so and that's making your own herbal medicines there's so many things it can be you can start with something as simple as dandelion and plantain that you find in your own yard and start making simple safe medicines with those things and you can get to more complex things like comfrey and and such and and you can do so much with these things but get some good books i'll recommend a book or two in the show notes for you to check out i've got a couple of them really like them i've been i've been practicing a lot with the plantain and the dandelion especially doing a lot with that and my comfrey as well i I grow a lot of comfrey here on my homestead so those three things i do a lot with and i'm getting into more and more things as i go so make your own or Make your own herbal medicines. I think it's a great, great thing to do. Number 10, practice skill development. There, all these things are skills I'm talking about anyway, but I just say practice these things and add other skills. You know, maybe you want to learn how to do leather work or you want to, um, you know, learn how to, to, to process an animal. You, there are places you can go to learn those things. Uh, you can do workshops and, and other farms and it's a great time to learn these things. Uh, learn how to process a chicken. Um, uh, you know, maybe you want to learn how to be a better cook and you want to take a class on cooking from scratch, something like that. There are so many things you can hone in on and, and really take the time to, to develop those skills right now before you get on a large homestead. Or even if you plan on staying where you're at forever, these are skills that you can develop right there and use right where you're at. And number 11, finally, is a, an important one, and it's build and utilize a homesteading community. It, it's a wonderful time to to start making friends, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better way to put it, making friends that that you can be of benefit to, but that can also be a benefit to you, and and people who also are interested in homesteading, uh, people who are homesteaders, people who can teach you things, people you can even help. I mean, maybe you want to go and and work on a homestead, and you want to learn some things, but you can provide some labor for them and help them out. Uh, or whatever you can go to to meetups where they talk about homesteading. Uh, you can do uh, go to training um, uh, programs and things, and you can build a homestead community there. Uh, you could do workshops at your own place if you if you start developing good skills and you're getting good at something. Maybe you want to do a workshop and you want to invite five or six people into your kitchen and teach them how to can or teach them how to ferment. Or maybe, you know, you've got a little herb garden. You want to invite some people over and show them what you got and what you can do with it. I mean, it's just a great time to to build and utilize a homesteading community. These people will be helpful to you. You will be helpful to them. And I think it's a huge part of being a homesteader is being part of a homesteading community. So I would say those are 11 tips for getting started homesteading, no matter where you're at, really. But if you're in an apartment or a place with a small backyard, those things are all doable. And people think, well, I want to be out in the country where I can do the things I want to do. And there's so many people who get out in the country that aren't even doing all those things. There's so much you can do right where you're at. So I would encourage you to get started right where you're at. And as I talked about earlier, these are skills you can pass on to your children and grandchildren. And, uh, you know, develop these skills. Be part 
of a homesteading community and continue to grow and learn. And if your goal is to one day end up, um, you know, on, on 20 acres, 50 acres, living out in the woods, off grid, these are skills that will only help you. And it's not wasted time. So uh, do all you can where you're at or be satisfied with where you're at and continue to grow in these skills and develop right where you're at. You could spend a lifetime learning and growing in an apartment and fine-tuning homesteading skills in an apartment. I, it can be done, and I think it's not, a, it's not a bad thing to do. And I just encourage folks to do that because I know, I know not everybody uh, can run out and get 50 acres. I know not everybody can do all, uh, raise all the animals they want or grow all the things in their garden they want. But there is so much you can do. And I just want to encourage you and hopefully inspire you to, to get started today doing those things. We're, we're just, depending on where you're at, of course, maybe weeks or maybe you're in growing your spring garden right now, uh, beginning it. Um, maybe you got a little while before you can get started with it. But what a great time to maybe get a container garden going. I would just so encourage you to do that. And I, I if you do, I, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, if, you're, if this has encouraged you to, to take some steps to start homesteading today right where you're at, you know, tell us about it. Uh, you can uh, leave a comment uh, in the show notes, or you can uh, join our Homestead Front Porch Facebook group. I would so love uh, for you to join, and uh, and there's so many people in there that could even help you and encourage you on your homesteading path, and I'm sure you'd have something to offer to us as well. So uh, be part of that group. Uh, also, I would encourage you to sign up for my newsletter. I did miss a couple weeks in the last month. I think I sent them out just every couple week, every other week the last month or so. But usually I send out a, a, an email, a newsletter, once a week. And, um, you know, I usually just give links to, to what I've covered if I wrote any new blog posts or the new podcasts that are out. But I also have some links to other things in there. A lot of times I'll maybe point you to some other uh, great things I found on the Internet or something like that. So I would encourage you to, be, to uh, join the newsletter. So just go to the website, smalltownhomestead.com. And you can sign up. You see several places there, probably even a pop-up maybe. But there's several places to sign up for our newsletter there. And I would encourage you to do that. I just, again, want to thank everybody for being part of this community. I want to, again, thank uh, Troy and Kelly for doing the podcast. And, you know, uh, you mentioned last week, Troy, that you, you guys were tossing around whether to do the one you did or to maybe do one on homeschooling. I think I'd like to hear that one on homeschooling one day. So I might invite you back to talk about that. Maybe you, you two would want to come on and actually talk about that homeschooling thing. It's not something I did uh, with my children, but I know a lot of homesteaders have a lot of interest in it. And uh, you know what? I think it's a great thing. And uh, I know it ain't for everybody, as you mentioned, but I think folks that are interested in it would love to hear about it. So if you guys would want to do that, get with me, Troy, and I'd love to maybe, uh, you know, turn you loose on another episode, you two loose on another episode to talk about homeschooling and, and share your wisdom in that. So uh, if that's something you want to do, let me know. Uh, I think the, I think the community would love to hear it. So I think that's about all I'm going to cover this week. Uh, I just thank you for joining me. I thank you for being patient with me because I know we missed one week, uh, guest host for a couple weeks. Things have been changing around a little bit and uh, hang in there with us. We'll get back to normal, maybe get back to even some longer, better podcasts on my end. I know I've kept them kind of short here recently, but uh, I thank you for bearing with me and uh, helping me. And uh, those of you in the front porch who've kind of picked up the slack since I haven't been able to hang out in there as much and, and post things, I really appreciate that. Thank you for welcoming uh, new people into the group. And, and thank you for, for just keeping the post coming and the conversation going in there. And I hope to really be a lot more active in there uh, over the next uh, several weeks as things are kind of going back to normal in my household. Um but you know what? That's uh, that's life, right? I mean, you're going to have those times when things are crazy busy. You're going to have those times when you have more free time. And and uh, right now we're going through a crazy busy time. And I appreciate you all being patient with me. So, hey, uh, until next week, um, happy homesteading and God bless. Thanks for listening. To see the show notes for this podcast or listen to other podcast episodes, go to smalltownhomestead.com. There you can also read our blog, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and take advantage of the many resources we make available to help you along in your homesteading journey. Please share this podcast and help us to carry out our mission of helping others to homestead today for a better tomorrow.